for it TV. The world is thinking. I know immediately after 9-11, uh, a lot of Americans uh, flummoxed by – flummoxed may be the wrong word here by, – by what had happened, decided to, to look at Islam more closely, and sales of the Quran shot up in this country. Uh, <laughs> a lot of non-Muslims re re reading it for the first time. That's such a bad idea. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, I mean, and, and so if you read the Quran in a way, so let's say you were, you'd open it up to one page and look at it, uh, I think a lot of people are, are shocked by what right. they see. Granted, people are shocked by the Bible as well if you open, open it up in, in other religious texts. But can you talk about that, how it's, yeah, it's a, a mistake for non-Muslims yeah. to, to look at uh, it that way? I mean, way. Muslims don't read the Quran from, from first to last. That's not how the Quran was ever meant to be read. It was deliberately put together in, without order, without chronology, without theme. Uh, it was simply put together by the longest chapters to the shortest chapters, and the chapters themselves uh, are completely randomly put together. They have titles that have nothing to do with what the chapter is about, and this was on purpose because the compilers of the Quran didn't want any kind of human activity to take away from the divine nature of the text. There's no commentary. Uh, the, I mean, it's, it's a, a completely baffling text for someone who's used to reading all these wonderful stories about Jacob blowing his horn, or Joshua blowing his horn, and walls coming down, and, and you know, d dramatic battles. It has nothing to do with Muhammad. Muhammad is not mentioned in the Quran except for a handful of times. It says nothing about the history of Islam whatsoever. Uh, it's just simply God talking in random uh, bits. That's it. And so most Muslims, when they read the Quran, they just sort of open it up at random and just begin reading certain verses. Uh, but you're right. A lot of people picked up the Quran at Barnes & Noble, and they started at the beginning and read it through as though they were starting at Genesis. If you actually made it to the end, mazel tov. I mean, <laughs> good, goodness gracious. Uh, but you probably didn't. You probably got confused. What I did notice, however, is a dearth of uh, both you know, amateurs and so-called experts who basically dissected the Quran for bits of savagery and then used that as an excuse to say, well, this is Islam uh, promoting violence. Uh, I'm not even going to respond to that because it's too unsophisticated. It doesn't merit a response uh, except to say, have you read Deuteronomy lately? Um, <laughs> but all texts we have to understand, uh, any text that matters, any scripture that matters, talks about war and peace, talks about violence and nonviolence. Uh, if it only talks about one of those things, it's an irrelevant text. Um, the reason we read the Torah after 5,000 years is because it still speaks to the modern condition. It talks about everything that you want to, you know, to have talked about. Uh, and the same is true of all great uh, religious uh, scriptures. So uh, I think it's important to read the Quran. I think it's important to probably read a book about the Quran. I suggest no God but God. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, but, you know, it, it, understand that it's, you're not reading the Bible. It's a different kind of text. We're, we're down to our last question here, and we'll, we'll take a question fr from, from the audience. Uh, this, this question uh, has to do with your earlier uh, idea that, that um, 50 years from now, we'll look back on this period of, of, of uh, Muslims in America and maybe laugh or what, what have you. But th this, this questioner asks, well, I mean, we, we live, he's talking about California here, we live on the left coast, and, and um, what, if you venture to the middle and south of the United States, you'll see uh, what this question calls pre-Civil War ideals. Um, so can you, can you talk about that very, very briefly, about how we, in a way, we live in a lot different Americas. There's the America of the West Coast, East Coast, and the middle ground, but, you know. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that by coming to the rescue of the Midwest and the South, where I've lived both. I've, I lived in Mississippi. I have a home in New Orleans. Uh, I lived and taught in Iowa for, for three years. I know the middle of this country, and it is not what you think it is. I was a professor at the University of Iowa when September 11th happened, uh, and I was a, a professor of Islamic and Middle Eastern studies, the first professor, the first full-time professor in the history of the state. Uh, 
And uh, I would go to these conventions and meet my fellow professors at Harvard and Cambridge and uh, at UCLA and Berkeley, and their lives were miserable. They were dealing with purges of departments, arguments about uh, Israel and Palestine, uh, entire departments up in flames uh, in post-September 11th. I was in heaven at the University of Iowa. My is introduction to Islam class went from 37 to 250 people. Uh, I had, you know, the ear of the governor. Uh, I walked, I mean, I traveled around the state talking to everyone. There is an earnestness, I think, uh, in the middle of this country that comes from feeling a little bit isolated, whereas I'm sorry to say those of us who live on the coast think we already know everything, and so there's nothing to be learned. And so when something like September 11th happens, rather than trying to find out more, we revert to our sense of absolutism and begin fighting each other. So thank God for the middle of this country. Thank God for the South. Our thanks to Reza Aslan, author of How to Win a Cosmic War, God, Globalization, and the End of the War on Terror. We also want to thank our audiences here and on the radio. I'm Jonathan Curiel, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, celebrating more than a century of enlightened discussion, is adjourned. <laughs>